Okay, so good morning. I am really delighted to join here from uh, um, the Netherlands. I wish I could have been there in person. Unfortunately, it was not possible um, due to restrictions because of COVID. But um, please uh, allow me to say a couple of words uh, about the landscape uh, of alternative lending and why we are here today and how do I see the future in lending. So maybe the first question is why alternative credit? We are very much used to going to banks uh, for lending, but it shouldn't always be like this. Actually, uh, in, 90, in mid 90s, uh, Bill Gates said the following, um, banking is necessary, banks are not. And if you think about this, um, you go to banks uh, for mortgages, uh, for cars, most of the time these are long-term loans. What do you give to the bank? Uh, you give short-term loans, your salary, uh, short-term deposit. And the banks need to do this maturity transformation, this risk transformation. That's why they have to be regulated. That's why there are a lot of control, control restrictions uh, are in place. But if you logically think about um, where are our savings uh, with our pensions, with our insurance uh, schemes, uh, with, um, with our, sometimes with our pillow, but uh, um, there is a perfectly natural way to connect borrowers and lenders more efficiently. Borrowers want uh, loans, there are new data available, there's a generation, generation transfer uh, that um, enables a different culture, and lenders, uh, insurance companies, uh, retail people, um, have a lot of money and they can determine um, what they want to do with their money. In addition, they finance the real economy um, on a very good risk-adjusted return basis, so they have better return. And we shouldn't forget, um, there is something nice about investing, uh, the control and, and the fund factor that they will apply. So let's look a bit um, what has happened um, with banks in the last, uh, basically, uh, decade uh, since the financial crisis. You know, I have been in banking and uh, in asset management for more than 20 years, so I have been fortunate enough to see um, quite a lot uh, what has happened in the banking sector. So after the financial crisis, um, uh, since basically 2008, more than 7 trillion disappeared uh, from the total assets of the European banking sector. Just to put this in context, in um, 2009, I was working for, um, for Fortis, when um, BNP Corridor acquired us. And uh, at that time, the balance sheet of BNP Corridor was 2.1 trillion of the requiring port is 2.8 trillion. And two years later, I had a presentation from the chief financial officer and he informed us that the balance sheet of the port is bank, the almost 700 billion balance sheet is entirely gone. So what we felt uh, on this, uh, lack of lending capacity, lack of um, borrowing um, ability, and a very sluggish economic growth. Um, now, how does it look ever since? You know, um, in the last couple of years, if you look at 2015, 2019, the balance sheet has stabilized, but uh, we have seen still a constant decline uh, towards lending uh, to SMEs. We have also seen a constant decline in FTE, so I mean, thousands of people uh, disappeared uh, from, from the sector. And um, the sector is going through um, major transformation. So we discussed about um, the, the, the balance sheet and the decline in balance sheet in the sector. Many people say there is still that. Um, people estimate still a two, three, three and uh, uh, yeah. But it's not only that, uh, what I noticed in the last couple of years. Um, 
it's not only the gap uh, in financing, but a gap in culture, a gap in expectations, and a gap in ability to service. In the last years, customers became very adept with uh, different uh, financing um, technologies, uh, different expectations that they receive from e-commerce platforms. As a result, they want to have the same level of service quality also from banks, which is mostly digital, which is quick, uh, savvy, and uh, customer-friendly culture. And I think um, this gap um, is really being served by a lot of e-commerce or alternative finance providers. So if I need to summarize what's going on in the industry, um, we are seeing the industry of revolution in the financial sector. And it's extremely fun to see this and experience it in my everyday life. When I started making presentations uh, to universities, business schools, and conferences a um, couple of years ago, I said, um, who would have thought that the market cap of uh, Deutsche Bank uh, would be the same as PayPal? And then life uh, and the time passed, and I had to say, who would have thought that the market cap of PayPal would be two times bigger? So every time when I'm making this presentation, I have the habit now to refer to PayPal and uh, Deutsche Bank. And I looked up this morning, and the market cap of PayPal is 16 times bigger than the market cap of Deutsche Bank. I think it says it all, but it's not only PayPal. There are a number of newcomers, um, new names that exist today and did not exist a uh, couple of years ago or a decade ago. So why is this industrial revolution uh, happening? I think the number of factors are coinciding, the opportunity with the construction of balance sheet of banks, the availability of data combined with technology, changing customer habits, and great examples that we have seen in e-commerce, and um, a coinciding regulatory change, um, um, PSD2 and open banking APIs, uh, enabling a clear shift in business models. And what we should not forget um, is also the demand, the high demand for investment products. People want yield. Uh, people want coupon. If you think about it, probably the best uh, income you can find um, um, is coming from loans, um, mortgages, um, uh, real estate income, which can be a real and natural hedge for your future liability. And what we see in banking is actually exactly what we have seen in a number of other industries uh, in music, in Retail um, and maybe a nice quote to mention here that I firmly believe in uh, in the context of retail. Um, uh, I don't think retail is dead. Maybe a terrible experience is are dead, and I think it's uh, it's exactly the same which is currently happening in banking. Banking is not dead. Maybe a banking is clearly dead, and that's why we see clear emergence of a number of new players that are joining. And maybe I would like to dwell a bit uh, on data. The amount of data we have is significantly bigger and broader, which enables new applications with a technology, with a hardware, which is enabling better transfer of data and better applications. And let me tell you one empirical example of it. Um, a year ago, I was in a conference, and um, somebody told me that based on my email, he will tell me my credit um, score. And I was looking at the person very cynically. And um, he said, OK, give me your name. And uh, the email address, and not, my, not my name, sorry about it. I gave uh, my email address. He punched in my email address. And uh, surprisingly, the person knew everything about me, where I work, um, what I signed up for, um, what are the uh, e-commerce links I have been using. And I was very surprised. Um, and he says, you know, I'm not going to tell you uh, 
I'm not going to be able to tell everything about you, but what I can say and feed to the underwriting, uh, take underwriting their platform is um, basic data that I feel comfortable that you have this email address for 10 years, uh, you have been using Amazon for 10 years, you have been using um, Booking.com for 10 years, uh, which means that you are a real person, you have your pet experience. So this credit platform can use those that do not have this data uh, that month and can focus their risk analysis on those. This is just one application, but there are chocolates of applications like that that enable uh, platforms uh, like SAP, uh, other consumer platforms to spend time on things and on on things and on papers that are really worth watching um, and analyzing better and focus on issues that uh, require better analysis. So I'm also working for the European Commission to analyze um, different uh, new data um, and fintech applications and the amount of uh, new applications, amount of new solutions I see are really tremendous. So it's not only underwriting, but also data analytics, um, uh, robotic process, uh, early warning signals, enabling CFOs uh, to better predict uh, working capital needs, uh, KYC, uh, on to money laundering, and I can go on and on and on. And if I go back to my slides, um, these applications enable all sorts of a plug and play approach and a shift in the business model. So you don't need to do everything the best. You know what you need to know, what you are the best in, and how you plug in those that are really the best. And Let's move now to the investor side. So what's happening um, in the last 20 years, um, if I look at the investable universe, and I'm a historian, so I always like to look at big trends. Um, what you can notice is that the world of publicly listed entities uh, has reduced uh, by half. So the amount of um, listed companies uh, where we can invest uh, either in equity or bonds has reduced significantly. So a lot more private companies exist. And meanwhile, there is an increasing, there is an increasing universe of private market. And on the right side, you see the right powder, the private market as a kind of management that has really tempered it uh, in the last uh, two decades. So there are not only um, new companies that become private, new companies that are born, but also investment solutions both in the private equity and the private debt side are increasing. And of course, uh, there is a demand, but there is also supply. But it belongs to said investors need private markets to obtain profit. So if I look at um, the expected investment return uh, of portfolio, um, it's decreasing. We are living in a low yield environment. Uh, if you look at um, government bonds from the US, from Switzerland, Euro bonds, they have very low um, expected yield and expected return. I think it's fair to say that a lot of dividends have been cut. Uh, so the dividend income stream has also been reduced but imagine if you are an insurance company, a pension fund, or if you just want to make sure that you have money for your kids' study, um, for universities, or if you want to have a proper pension and you don't want your, um, your money to disappear, um, you want income. And this income can easily be a lot easier to obtain in private money. So this data is actually from BlackRock, and you can clearly see that private markets, both in equities and private debt, in the last um, um, decades, actually significantly outperformed the, uh, the public markets. This outperformance had been around um, uh, 3 to 5 percent, but if you don't need the liquidity, this 3 to 5 percent actually made a significant significant difference. So it's 
not a wonder that um, this six, seven trillion gap that had been created um, as a result of the disappearance of balance sheet uh, of traditional banks has shifted to a number of alternative solutions. And it's not only um, alternative solutions in terms of alternative lending platform, but also new banks that have been built. So if you look at the left side, um, there are a number of new banks next to traditional banks, uh, like PayPal, N26, uh, and a number of others. And there are, on the middle, you see um, a lot of alternative lending players. A lot of players like uh, insurance companies, um, private debt providers, um, and pension funds, uh, asset management companies that grant into um, providing alternative solutions and investing, um, investing in uh, alternative fixed income. Maybe from my own example, which is um, uh, from the Netherlands, um, the six, uh, the, 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 the mortgage sector in the Netherlands is approximately 600 billion. And because of the reduction of the balance sheet and still very high demand, uh, within three years, 30% uh, of the market share of um, this uh, mortgage lending had been captured by new players, like the American Credit, uh, like Mint. What they, did, what they have done, they teamed up with pension funds and um, Wall Street. Uh, the pension funds need to yield and they provided solutions to capture 30% of the market share in Dutch mortgage on the market. And I find this an amazing example because uh, it's like the Deutsche Bank and PayPal example. Who would have thought that this sort of things can happen and the oligopolistic market uh, can uh, provide this sort of uh, new opportunities. Um, but it's happened. Um, and, and of course, we have um, a lot of uh, digital lenders and what I call alternative lending 2.0. Uh, like SKP, that provide um, digital underwriting um, uh, solutions um, and high impact for investors, um, you know, very flexible um, solutions with a lot of innovation. And, um, you know, some of these players can appear as regulated banks, like so far, uh, obtaining the banking license after uh, two years. Some can do um, on the asset management license, uh, we use all different regulatory framework. Um, so the, it became an extremely um, colorful place. What I find very important when I assess, when I comment on uh, lending solutions is culture, innovation capacity, and quality of underwriting. And, and that's where I feel that new players can add quite a lot of value based on that data. So, at the end of the day, if you look at winners uh, from industrial revolutions, and just look at your own example, um, if you needed to pay uh, 40 euros for a CD you would love. How about mentioning that you used to pay this amount uh, for it, for it a lot, um, they paid five, six, uh, maybe ten years ago. I think you all agree that using Spotify is a lot better solution, a lot better solution, and we wouldn't expect uh, and accept paying very high uh, amount for solutions um, uh, in music streaming. And I think we are also the clear winner in and the data in e-commerce, you have better access to and better transparency for buying clothes, uh, the same clothes that I used to buy um, five years ago, I can have access to a lot cheaper price with a lot of transparency. If I, if I want to buy a washing machine, if I want to buy a refrigerator, I have a lot better transparency in pricing and a lot better um, ability to be in control of my decisions. And I see something similar in financing. I, I think it's fair to say that um, the better data uh, is enabling 
a lot better on the right, as he says. Um, uh, so at the end of the day, um, the data enables um, um, uh, a reduction in pricing and better risk adjusted return. So the borrowers, um, they, they come to us and they come to the platforms because they feel that the, this pricing is better, the flexibility is better, and significant reduction happens uh, in, in underwriting. And this is a McKenzie study that I refer to here, is that uh, with um, the appearance of other lending platforms, the time for underwriting has reduced uh, significantly. So sometimes 90%. And this is what Morak referred to, is that we are able to underwrite a loan, um, basically sometimes even an hour, if it's uh, not depending on the amount. And why is that? Because the amount of information is there. You know, if you go and you want to have a mortgage, um, actually the key information that an underwriter needs to decide for your personal circumstances, this information is there. The ability to gain this access to the information, make a judgment, really depends on the ability to capture and analyze the information in a significantly reduced time. And maybe I can refer to um, to, uh, to Guru here, um, Jack Ma, that I truly respect, um, and he is the founder of Alibaba. And he explained his vision on lending. And he said the following, um, the mission in lending is for him uh, three to three one zero. So the three uh, minutes refers to underwriting a decision and one minute for the investment and zero human interaction. Is this the future of uh, lending? Is the future of underwriting? Uh, maybe um, you know Alipay uh, is one of the biggest uh, uh, bank uh, right now. It's uh, about to go to IPO and um, that's also one of the biggest um, value creation uh, that I have seen in Asia. And I'm really hoping that there will be a lot more uh, like that. I do feel that uh, Europe is lagging a bit behind, but I think the direction we are going to is pretty clear. So at the, at the end of the day, uh, the most important beneficial is the borrower uh, with more inclusion, less judgment, and better service. And let's look at uh, the other side um, of uh, the balance, um, uh, which is why to invest in private credit. And again, this is an experience um, I built in the last uh, 15 years um, since I worked with institutional investors. And I've seen um, that increasing appetite towards uh, private market solutions. So I capture here the key reasons. Uh, I think the most important reason is the risk adjusted return, which is clearly better than in public uh, securities. Uh, so it improves uh, the risk reward profile of the portfolio. Um, I very often uh, see the most important uh, advantage, which is total with the yield. Uh, private credit has gained uh, importance uh, because of its ability to generate coupons. So in private equity, where we sometimes also invest in, and we can have a high, we can have a higher IRR, but the IRR, the actual capital gain, comes at a later stage. The key benefit of uh, estate bureau and also in private credit um, investment proposition is the coupon. It's not easy to get at this level of, of coupon uh, and income stream from any other investment um, securities. Very often institutional investors like pension funds and insurance companies uh, also invest uh, because um, of uh, the instrument's ability to have uh, live with the matching um, with, their, um, um, with their book. So basically, we know what the income stream they need and they try to adjust the assets, the underlying assets income stream to provide a perfect matching, both in terms of currency and also in terms of coupon side. Uh, the fourth important reason is portfolio diversification. As I mentioned earlier, the investor universe has reduced in public markets. So if you want to have uh, an increasing 
diversification, it's simply not possible just to be in public markets. So this is one of the key reasons why institutional investors and also uh, private individuals went into the investment in private market conditions. Uh, the fifth reason is the increasing awareness in, in environmental, social, and governance related investments. And it's very clear that SMEs they can actually have a real impact uh, for the economy are not public listed companies. SMEs are employing 70% uh, of people in Europe and uh, responsible for over 80% of the innovation. So if you want to create sustainable development and positive impact, then uh, it will mostly happen in the SME segment by SME companies. So I do expect that this will be also one of the most important drivers for investment solutions. And the last um, important aspect I mentioned before is the engagement and interest, which I consider an emotional reward. I have been in the business world, as I mentioned, um, for more than two decades in asset management, uh, 15 years, uh, and it's incredibly uh, rewarding to work with private um, market investment opportunities. And because of um, um, raw data, because of um, um, the less transparency in the segment, you can actually add a lot more value. In public market solutions, we have a lot of information available in Bloomberg, Reuters, um, there are a lot of analysts uh, covering uh, the different uh, securities. What we all love about um, private market is the editing that you can actually do um, following your conviction. So then it, it is uh, giving a lot of emotional um, reward in my field. So that is Estate Guru, and maybe a couple of words in the last five minutes I would like to use to explain why I joined Estate Guru. And, um, and why I believe in it, and what I think it has to offer uh, in the context of different investment solutions. You know, I have done my PhD on alternative learning solutions, and um, I have looked at a number of platforms um, and um, assess the investment proposition. I do feel that I think the investment proposition is very superior. And before I go into the superior investment proposition, um, Couple of words I actually joined as people. So I really like the team, and for me, in any investment, uh, in the in an investment business, the culture and the team is the most important. What drives people? What I find in Estate Guru is that the key driver is excellence, continuous improvement, respect, and being bold but not arrogant, and believing in something, and running the extra miles. Running the extra miles for investors, run the extra miles to be better every day. And for me, this is a key uh, driver for success. And I think in any businesses that makes a difference between winners and losers. I see this culture very much coming across and that I talk to everybody in that category with a combination of a lot of passion and drive uh, to, to improve uh, value creation. Uh, uh, in this business segment. And I joined uh, because I very much believe in the investment um, uh, and value proposition, what, uh, what um, Morak also described. If you want to be a leading uh, real estate platform, digital real estate platform solution in Europe, that's a bold ambition, but it's perfectly feasible. Um, and I feel, I mean, it's a, it's a two, three year market that we intend to create a better intent to take a significant um, market share. And I do feel that COVID uh, will significantly speed up the potential of digital lending solutions. We don't need um, human interaction to create value um, in the current market. We need proper underwriting, we need proper data, and we need proper investment solutions. So COVID, uh, um, like in e-commerce, we also speak of uh, the market share gain, digital underwriting solutions, uh, both in banks, uh, 
movement uh, and also to learning for our Brazilian customers as well. So, what is the uh, investment proposition of SAP? So, if you want to invest, uh, either you are a retail person or an uh, institutional investor, there are the key reasons why you invest with us uh, outside here. The most important is you know, I don't see very many uh, investment um, uh, solutions that provide this level of risk adjusted return. And that's based on my experience. Uh, I see similar uh, solutions uh, providing lower yield, uh, with higher counterpart risk, and less security. And uh, SD Guru has a combination of all. I see uh, an exposure to the real economy, which are really low. I call to SME, giving money to the real economy, to, to real SME uh, that actually need money uh, in a lot better way um, than we have seen before. As Marek mentioned, um, close to 100% over 96% of all investments are secured by real assets. Um, it's all euro based. Um, uh, enabling significant diversification, so you can sleep uh, during the night. Uh, you don't need to put your um, your um, all your eggs um, uh, in one basket. So you have a diversification plan, and you can have uh, investments in 50 or 100 years. As I mentioned, there is a high level of engagement where you can have value. You can select your own investments, or you can do auto invest. Uh, it's a key account factor. Uh, and the last uh, is uh, the weighted average loan amount. Uh, you don't need to wait uh, too long before you actually have a redemption. So these are self liquidating short term loans uh, where in fact, equity, you need to wait years for your return to really get to uh, form uh, on a diversified portfolio with relatively short term. So I think I'm. Um, close to finalizing um, uh, my presentation. Um, I really would like to thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for uh, enabling me to say a couple of words. Um, I hope you get across a um, very strong uh, conviction um, for both estate guru and for uh, alternative learning from my words. Uh, we are here to help you. We are here to create um, investment solution and returns for you. And please join us um, uh, on this rewarding journey. And I'm extremely honored and flattered uh, to be part of this company. Thank you very much.